Shibata. I'm Clay Horton. I'm Daniel Humbert. And you are tuned into the Seven Podcast. This is a podcast that we've been running for the last month or so, talking about uh, the seven deadly sins and virtues. And today we are focusing on lust and chastity and envy and kindness, which will be really fun. Fun. <laughs> to talk about fun. With my <laughs> Put some good ones together. Yeah. So lust. Let's start there. We talked about it on Sunday a lot. Um, what's your personal experience of lust? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I have it. It's a part of me. You get no more than that. Yeah. I have lustful thoughts. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else I'm going to say. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's a part of the human condition. And I think, um, you know, from the second you hit puberty, mm. uh, it it's learning what lust is and what's appropriate and what's not and um, I think it's not something you get figured out right away at, at a certain point but it's uh, it's something that I think we continually have just like all of the seven deadly sins yeah it, it can manifest itself in in numerous ways and um, sometimes even when we're like oh we've got this under control it might reemerge in a different way I, I have often felt, and so I, Alyssa, I'd love for you to respond to this if you don't mind. I've often felt that men struggle with lust more than women, but I remember you saying something about you 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 live out of lust or something like that. I, and yeah, I, I think that uh, maybe we just struggle with lust differently. Uh, we do a lot of things differently. Yeah. But so I actually um, brought with me, so I don't know if y'all are familiar with Enneagram at all. We actually have a class coming up yeah. at Treach. I think there's only four spots left. Um, that's an Enneagram class, and it's basically a personality typing class and helping you better understand yourself and your core motivations. And my Enneagram number is I'm type eight. And a type eight motivation is I want to be self-reliant. I want to prove my strength. I want to resist weakness. I want to be seen as important. I want to dominate the environment that I'm in. And I, my core motivation is I do not want to be controlled by anybody. I want to be in control. But what's funny about that is the sin that I struggle with the most as type eight is lust. Hmm. And as they define it, you know, we often think of lust as uh, sexuality, uh, but it actually is a lust for life. Yeah. And so uh, it, what it says here is my personality type struggles with the lust for life and the drive for power uh, that can show up as sexual intensity, but it also shows up in that I pick a fight just to ratchet up the emotional temperature of the room. Um, I lose interest in a dull relationship. If I'm having a conversation with you and you're not interesting me, I'm like, <laughs> done. You know, I'm out of here. That's why our um, conversations are always short. I, <laughs> I get it now. So, and I, I think that, you know, as an eight, I am direct, I am forceful. Um, and so, you know, while lust in the church tradition has always been seen as sexual desire, um, it, for me, it's really a hunger for intensity yeah. in everything that I do. And I think that that comes across in so many uh, areas of my life where when I work out, the way that I eat. Like if I decide I'm going to do something, I'm going to go mm -hmm. 200% to yeah. the point that I might steamroll other people uh, because I have a, such a lust and intensity for what it is I'm doing. I think that's an interesting taste on that because for me that's about fervor and passion. And mm -hmm. fervor and passion are positive components of that. So I find it interesting that that's defined as lust. Um, and clearly lust is, you know, sort of this extravagant fervor in this case for sex. But as we talked about Sunday, it, it's not just about sex, right? It could be for power or it could be for things or it could be for um, uh, relationships. So lust isn't just about sex. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it, it's it's all kinds of things. and And... As we talked about Sunday, a big component of that is the selfishness of it and the way in which it's sort of why it becomes a sinful nature is because it's all about what I want, what I can achieve or what I can conquer or what I can get. And um, that's what makes it destructive. So, uh, you know, and, and on the sex end of it, you know, society is not helping us, as I mentioned Sunday, with, you know, the images we see, the, the commercials that are portrayed, the, the casualness with regard to sex. 
um, I think just plays into all of that. And so. But that's where I also think there is a huge difference between men and women. And, you know, it, it is interesting being a woman on this panel um, that in general, I mean, there's always outliers, mm. but in general, women are not as image driven right. as men. Right. And so for me, when I think about, well, yeah, sex sells and there's sex everywhere in our culture, but that doesn't necessarily drive me to lust. Like right. if I see an attractive man walking down the street with his shirt off, doing a workout or something like that doesn't drive me to lustful thoughts. I'm just yeah. like, Oh, that's a good looking man. And I move on, yeah. you know? And so, uh, that's why, you know, for me, lust as a sexual uh, nature, it really doesn't hit me as hard. Yeah, yeah. I don't think. I think that's been my experience as well, and why I wanted you to address that question, because I, I do think that is one distinction between men and women with regard to lust, and and therefore I have often felt that men struggled with lust as a deadly sin more than women did just because of that one distinction. But if we broaden it outside of sex and sexuality, then I think there's a it's an equal equalizer, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, the church has done a disservice to uh, understanding the sin of lust because historically the church has been run by men, mm. and so uh, the. The entire understanding of lust is sexual nature because mm. that's what men tend to struggle with more. Yeah. And so there's this lack of understanding of the full scope of lust. And I think that um, one of the most damaging elements is that um, the church only focused it historically, and I think it is shifting now, uh, but has focused on the negatives of sexuality mm -hmm. and yeah. hasn't really balanced out what is healthy versus unhealthy sexuality and what is sexuality that lives outside of lust right. in a healthy environment. Yeah. We, yeah, we've we've done a we've said lust is absolutely evil and so we've taught people to kind of have no mm -hmm. um, sexual appetite whatsoever until you're married and then all of a sudden you're married and yeah. then you can have uh, you know be sexually active and, and have sexuality and and for many people that I've, I've experienced they they struggle with going from zero to 100 <laughs> yeah. because the church has <clears throat> guilted mm -hmm. like put so much guilt around it is that if you have these thoughts it's 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 negative it's sinful and um, yeah I think we've done a, a huge disservice in, in that category I, I, I recall one of the things I mentioned Sunday was this whole sense of the, part of the problem in lust as it regards sex is um, that it sort of removes sexuality from the human relationship. Yeah. And um, because lust basically, again, as it refers to sex, is all about what I want, what I can get, how I can conquer, what I can achieve. And it just removes the whole human relationship component of sexuality, right? Because that's a huge component of our sexuality is how I want to relate with you and how I want to be with you and how I want to uh, have uh, time with you. And, and when we focus on the lust component, it's all about, well, I don't care about that. All I care about is what I can have, what I can get, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that applies. I mean, it's, it's very clear to see how that applies in sexuality. But, of course, that also applies with what I was talking about earlier with the lust for life because mm. often, you know, if I'm picking a fight with someone just for the sake of having an argument because I find it fun, I'm in no way caring for that other person. And I am in no way empathizing with, well, maybe they don't want to have this conversation or maybe they're not an argumentative person and don't enjoy debate yeah. or whatever it is. I'm just trying to get my kicks and giggles out of the situation. That's, that's where I see that, and, and many of these sins bleed over, right? But that's where I see pride sort of taking over the, the, the sin of lust, that, that, mm -hmm. that you want to conquer, if you will, or you want to achieve in that circumstance. And that's essentially the sin of pride. But it's got this overlap with lust, right? Yeah. So many of these sins overlap. We can see that. Like we talked a little bit about... Um, you know, lust as it regards to if I'm lusting after this cup or whatever, then that's, that lends itself either to greed or to envy as well, right? So there's these overlaps too. And we have a couple of questions that have come in, and it's a good time to remind you that mm. if you're watching right now, feel free to interact with us. We'll ask your or we'll answer your questions live. 
Um, so our first question is, what would you say is the dividing line between normal human attraction and lust? I don't know if I can define the, the line, but for me personally, the line is, you essentially identified it earlier. I can see an attractive person and simply acknowledge, oh, that's an attractive person. I, I admire their attractiveness and move on versus, oh, <laughs> I not only admire that attractiveness, but I, I want something to do with that or about that or to do something. And so a part of it is what I just call the next step. There's nothing wrong with admiring the human physique, the human body, uh, the way in which someone's taking care of themselves healthily, whatever. I, there's nothing wrong with that. And so I think the, the line becomes when I become selfish about what I want to do about that. It, it, I guess that's the way I would look at it. I, and I would almost say that it's hard to draw a line, but mm. you, you know when you've crossed it, <laughs> right? And, and even if it's not a um, physical crossing of it, just w if you're trying to be in step with the Holy Spirit, at some point, the Spirit's going to push back and go, whoa, that, you know, don't take it to that next, next step. Right. And another question that came through, which I find interesting, is there any upside to lust? <laughs> Well, I think you described it. I think the way uh, you live into it is as long as it's about fervor and passion, but that that fervor and passion does not consume you to the degree that we lessen somebody else. I think that fervor and passion is good. What about evolutionarily? Does Say lust, more. Does lust serve a purpose for the continuation of the human race? Oh my! I, I, I was watching. Ooh. I was watching two robins the other day. So the male robin is like the beautiful bird, right? And and so different species. Sometimes it's the male. Sometimes it's the yeah. female. And um, and I started I started thinking about humans in in that regard too. And um, but That's as we funny. think about moving forward, though, right? It. If, if it's a human attraction and what where we are is that we we don't have to be um we don't have to populate the earth just because we need to our species to survive so i think there's a an attraction to the whole person yeah. that is important and um so lust i think could even be removed that attractiveness still needs to be there but i think Physical attraction is a piece of it. Um, is lust unhealthy even within a marriage? Lusting after your partner? I don't think that's lust. I think that's admiration. I think that's um, building a fondness and celebrating what that looks like. I, I don't call that lust, but maybe maybe that's this, this distinction you reference about fervor and, and passion. Should we have that? Absolutely. Um, but I just, I define lust as, an, as a, a sort of the, the depth to which I've stepped over into selfishness versus what I want for you. I think that we might want to step into chastity because... Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, I was actually, um, as we move into chastity, which is not one of my favorite words. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I was listening to a podcast recently, and there was a woman named Jean Twenge who, uh, and I don't know if I'm saying her name last name right, but she's an expert in generational research, um, and she is, has been participating in a long time in studies um, looking at generations uh, as they enter their 20s and 30s, and what are the similarities and what are the differences. And what she found when combining the millennial generation and the baby boomer generation is on average, millennials have fewer sexual partners, uh, are more likely to have sex within a loving relationship, um, and they are wait until they're older to become sexually active compared to the baby boomer generation, which I find really interesting because um, it kind of contradicts the idea that making sexuality more available, which our culture is obviously mm -hmm. very available, uh, promotes unhealthy sexual relationships. Yeah. And so I wonder if there has been like this reemergence of chastity uh, generationally of like this self-control. I've heard the same thing. I've also heard it for not only millennials, but Gen Z. Yeah. And yeah. That, um, that that's actually the case that, you know, and so 
I reckon that's true. I, I, you know, to me, that's in anecdotal evidence, right? But um, I, I, I hope it's true. I reckon it's true. And so, you know, part of my goal on Sunday when we talked about chastity was to kind of, I don't know, erase if, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but sort of erase this sense that all chastity means is no sex. Mm-hmm. That all chastity mm-hmm. means is you just got to cut everything off. And, um, I, you know, maybe that was the original intent. I don't really know. But um, for me, it was more about boundaries and accountability and um, sort of um, finding ways to, quote unquote, control the urges, if you will, of lust. And so um, to me, that was helpful. I don't know about for y'all. Yeah, and, and I think as, um, as folks kind of deal with their own sexuality and try to figure out what's right and what's wrong for them, I think uh, people make the correct decision when it's more intrinsically motivated mm. when there are outside influences saying no you you can't have sex or you can't do this and this and this then at some point the person is able to go you know that's what they said but I'm gonna go do whatever I want and I, I would hope that the younger Millennials and, and Gen Z are being more empowered to to find out for themselves what is right um, you know, and, and ideally discerning that with a relationship with God, but that's far more powerful when they make decisions to to wait on sex as opposed to it just coming down force from their parents, mm-hmm. but for them to go, huh, who is God calling me to be? Who am I in this big world? How do I relate to other people? What is my role in all this? And when it's emerging from their own um, from inside, I, I think we get healthier results. Well, and I think that on top, you know, we talked about the church, you know, making the mistake of either not talking about sex or only talking about the negatives of sex. And someone threw out, uh, what role do you think STDs played in that generational shift? And I think that a lot of it is like, we do, the more we're willing to talk about it, the more mm-hmm. that education there is around it, the greater understanding of, uh, sexual relationships and what that means for not only our physical health but our mental health, our spiritual health, I think that we're just learning more generation to generation mm-hmm. of what impact this has on us and maybe uh, chastity is is kind of a, I don't know, a, a reaction mm-hmm. to all of the negative that we saw come out of it and like, oh man, we need to learn more about healthy sexuality. Mm-hmm. I would like to hope that. Mm-hmm. I really would. And I, that certainly kind of the tack that Kay and I took with our own two kids was, you know, neither one of us got talked to about sex, neither by church nor uh, by our parents. And so with both of our kids, uh, we've kind of talked ad infinitum about it, so much so that both of them, when they were younger, uh, say to even more now, um, quit talking about it. <laughs> I've had enough, you know, quit talking about it. So um, anyway, that was sort of our tact. Mm-hmm. Well, um, we probably we spent a little bit more time than we normally would on, on lust and chastity, but it's definitely a topic that people are interested in. What about envy and kindness? That's what we have coming up this Sunday. Mm. Um, Envy's fascinating because... Um, I think among the seven deadly sins, I think it's the one that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. I think it because it kind of has overtones of some of the others, and I think it also um, it has the least quote unquote benefit. I mean, when you have lust, you got sex. When you got greed, you got money. When you got pride, you got power. You know what I mean? When you got gluttony, you got food. Uh, with envy, there's sort of this negative deal, and so I think. Uh, I think envy often gets kind of lost in the shuffle and and we don't fully get it, right? And so um, I think it's important that we better, I don't know, um, figure out what, what, how is envy distinctive? How is envy different? Uh, and I know uh, you, you had a thought, for instance, about the difference between envy and jealousy and, and kind of what that looks like. And um, I don't know that I have a, a clear answer to that other than, um, you know, I think jealousy might be, gosh... I, I really wish I could have that or do that or be that, whereas envy, um, envy is, I, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be like the person that I, you know, want that crate from, or I wish I could be like that, and it kind of, it begins to consume you a little bit like lust does. It's a strange well, deal. and mm-hmm. envy on our bookmark, it's kind of extreme. It says that envy is actually 
hatred for someone because of what they have. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I think that um, this might sound very un-American of me, but I say things that are un-American all the time, <laughs> which makes me very American. Um, I think that one of the biggest lies that creates envy is the American dream. Yeah. You can have it all. You can do it all. You can be a businesswoman, and I'm going to speak from a woman's perspective. You can be a businesswoman. You can uh, be an incredible mother. You can have a rockin' body. You can have a loving husband. You can have a perfect family. You can have all of these things. And if you don't have all of these things, then you're failing. Mm. You're getting something wrong. Yep. And that creates, like, when we see in other people our perception, because it's all about perception, right. of I see her and she seems to have it all together, then it creates this envy and this mm-hmm. hatred for the other person because she's got it together and I don't. Right. I agree. And and that hatred, like you say, it, it's very strong, right? And so I think that's, again, where the sinfulness of this uh, concept comes from is I get really eat up inside of me because I want that or I want that quality or I want that thing or I want that person, that lifestyle, whatever. And um, it, it creates, and it's, I think the other component of envy is it not only makes me feel less than because I don't have it, but I have this bitterness toward you mm-hmm. because you do, whatever that thing is. Well, and I think, you know, another way, I, we've been talking a lot about gender differences today, but I think a lot of times, um, and Freud would have something to say about this, but I'm envious of men because... Mm-hmm. The patriarchy, it's in everything's in your favor, Mm -hmm. you know, and why can't I have that? And a perfect example is uh, I was with a friend at an airport and uh, we were just hanging out and and talking and he saw um, a man running down the airport chasing after a two year old Mm. that had run amok. And my friend said, a lot of people are going to look at him and say, father of the year, chasing after his kids in an airport, doing his things. Oh, isn't that sweet? Mm. But he said, if it was a woman, she mm. would be seen as the worst mother because she couldn't she lost control her, kid, her child. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just so envious in that moment of like, man, sometimes I feel like men have it so mm. easy <laughs> compared to women, which isn't always true. We all have our individual battles. But I think that sometimes I get so caught up in mm-hmm. those gender differences, I become envious and I can become hateful yeah. towards men for having what you have. Well, I think that's the, that's the issue, right? Right. Um, is, the, is that bitterness, that hatred or whatever. Um, and it, it can be consuming. I mean, I have found myself, you know, so part of my sinful way is, well, I look at another church and go, man, why can't we be like that church? Or why can't we do that thing that that church is doing? Or, um, and so you do, you get this envious feeling of, I want to be like that, and I'm actually bitter because they are like that. And it's, you know, it'll eat at you. Mm-hmm. Pure and simple. Well, and, and someone asked, is the difference between envy and role models be the hatred? So I guess looking to someone with envy versus admiration mm-hmm. of seeing them as a role model and maybe thinking of a, a celebrity. Am I? And maybe you want to talk about the Fire Island mm-hmm. that you are bringing yeah. up. Is that... Is it envy or is it someone I'm aspiring to be like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's good. Well, yeah, I think we can. I think we all need to be striving, right? And when I think about envy, I think um, when I find contentment with mm-hmm. where I'm at, I'm less likely to be envious. Right. But I also know I don't want to be so content that I become slothful. Mm-hmm. And so there's this balance <laughs> of looking at the next step, whatever that might be, professionally for the family, um, individually, and then saying, how can I move to that next level? What what is what are the right next steps? And then you, you alluded to that fire island piece. That sometimes I think when we when we look at uh, you know th- this was kind of financially right, like looking at a generation of people or a group of people that had a whole lot of money that ended up making some kind of getting messed over and losing some money. I, I was looking at them going, oh, too bad. They lost several thousand dollars on a big concert. Or, or you know, and, and a million, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the people, that, the individuals that were going yeah. to the concert, I'm like, oh, they had, oh, yeah. they had five to $10,000 to drop on a weekend. They lost their money. Boo-hoo. 
right? And I'm not compassionate towards that group of people. And I think, um, but I would never think on a whole like, oh, I, I, I have immense hatred for these mm-hmm. people, um, but I'm also not compassionate for yeah. them. And um, so therefore I'm not fully loving them like I, sh- I should. And, and so there's some envy, even when I, I look at other people and think, I'm not necessarily striving to be that, but if I'm not compassionate towards them, well, then I'm full of envy. Yeah. And how, you know, we've talked about compassion, you've talked about, but what the, the actual cure for envy is kindness, which confuses me. Mm. I don't know how kindness is the cure for envy. Yeah. So tell me why. Yeah, well, <laughs> so um, there's a common a commonality between all of the sins and all of the virtues. The commonality of all of the sins is they're all inwardly focused. It's all about me. What can I gain? What can I get? The, the commonality among all of the virtues is it's otherly focused. It's always outwardly towards other people. So that's the first distinction. And then the second, I think, with envy, there actually are a couple of virtues that kind of coalesce uh, around them. Kindness is one and charity is the other. And um, the concept there is rather than feeling bitterness towards that other person or, or even inwardly feeling less than you should be or, or think of yourself, if I'm kind or offer charity uh, toward that person, then I begin to get out of my own you know, concept. I get out of my own inward thoughts or inward feelings and I focus on the other. So imagine if I'm envious of, um, I mean, you say, for instance, men, what would it be like if I'm kind towards a single man, somebody that I know, and then I begin to recognize, well, not all men are that way, or not all men have that circumstance. Or in my case, I'm envious of another church. Look out. Watch out. The, I'm envious that, you know, we can do things without that, but no. <laughs> the other churches have, have signs that stay up the whole time. For those listening, our banner just fell behind us. <laughs> okay, it startled me. There you go. There we go. We can still function without that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm envious towards, for instance, another church, then what I need to do is somehow be kind towards them. Say a kind word about the church. Say a kind word about the pastor. That's how it begins to shuffle for us. I think. What do you think, Clay? Yeah, I, th- I think the more in many of these, it's all about our humanity, mm-hmm. right? When so when we recognize the humanity within somebody, and we experience that when we show them kindness, and then they reciprocate that, mm-hmm. and it and it builds a relationship, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, so we move forward, right? And, and even the, even locally, when you think about the most basics of who we are, that, you know, love God, love your neighbor. Sometimes we're envious of our neighbors, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it starts very close to home. We look across the street and go, they've got a, a nicer car than I do, mm-hmm. or they're able to do this or this to their house, and we become envious, mm-hmm. even though it might not feel like hatred, right. but as we start to love them, as we start to get to know mm-hmm. them, it, it's fine that they drive that car. Right. I mean, and, and we we become less jealous or, and like we said, they're all connected, but we become less envious when we can have that relationship. That's, that's right. It takes us out of ourselves because I do think the the sort of catch-22 of envy is it not only causes me to have this bitterness or hatred towards you for whatever it is you have, but it also makes me feel less than. So it's a double, sort of a double whammy. And if I can get outside of myself with either charity or kindness, then it helps me to, at a minimum, helps pull me out of my woe is me kind of a deal, but it also helps me to have a different and better attitude towards the other. Mm -hmm. So maybe that should be the goal of this week when you start to feel envious of somebody make an effort to mm. do something kind mm-hmm. for that person. Yeah, yeah. No, I would agree. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Big or small, yeah. saying you look very nice today. There you go. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly in right. In the proper context, because... <laughs> not not in the less, not, not in the less full way. I think that's about all we have time for today, though. Yeah. It just flies by. Those are big, big topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks for, for joining us for the podcast. Join us in worship this Sunday, where we're going to be talking about envy and kindness, so we'll be exploring this topic more. And then join us on June 11th, where we're going to be wrapping up this podcast, and we'll look at greed and generosity and then gluttony and self-control so we're i'm looking forward to both worship with us um, around seven and then also uh, our final podcast yeah be sure to download the card too because it's been real helpful for everybody including us yeah
We'll see you all soon. Bye. Take care.